the mindset shift. Mm -hmm. We tend to believe so much in foreign talent. Mm -hmm. I've been to places where I realize that uh, because somebody has got a skin different from mine, mm -hmm. people think they have better IQ. Mm -hmm. But we know that's not necessarily true. Yeah. So, and with this Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the emancipation of the African, and this coming at a time when the UN declared the decade of persons of, of African descent, it's vital that an African reign is it. Can we take advantage of African talent mm -hmm. to make the better of our continent? Uh, totally agree. That's very powerful. Um, now I'll just move on to now the tech sector. It's very interesting that you wear so many hats mm -hmm. and you wear them very well. So I think that's also very inspirational. But now let's talk about internet in Kenya. Uh, right. I think many people don't know, maybe because I'm your daughter, I have mm -hmm. the privilege of knowing that right. you, know, you brought internet into the country. Right. And I've heard the story of the, you know, the late nights and right. so whatnot. But I'm sure some viewers would be interested to sort of share sure. about that. So maybe sure. you can tell us a little bit about uh, that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that they are say when you're a toddler. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I was not born yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it came, yes. you hadn't been born. But later on in life, as we were now fine tuning, a few years later, yes, uh, I remember as we were trying to fine tune. Then uh, uh, once uh, the young girl would come and tell, tell daddy because daddy was sending, spending lots of time in his computer room, would say, "No, daddy, if you have nothing more interesting to do, come, we play." Uh -oh. Now. <laughs> But uh, that's notwithstanding, yes, um, the internet, when I got back home, uh, when, while in the UK and in the US for postdoc, my life depended on internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was even the evolution of internet, even in the West. It was not long before that internet became widely available. Mm -hmm. So it was like six of us. Kenyan then graduate students. Um, there was one, uh, Dr. Tien Mbare uh, in Finland, is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Dr. Matunde Nyanchama in Canada, mm -hmm. he still moves between Canada and Africa. And then there were three at MIT. Um, mm -hmm. um, there was Isi Makatiani, mm -hmm. uh, there was Gakio Karanja, mm -hmm. and there was Uma Gore, and uh, myself in the UK. We started communicating. It used to be very difficult to find news from home. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, I first went to the UK in '88, <clears throat> we would only get news about home uh, when we went to the High Commission in London oh. uh, during December 12th, mm -hmm. Jamuri Day, Independence Day. Mm -hmm. That's when we would get newspapers that are two, three months old. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. uh, but now with internet, well, I must also say it was extremely expensive to call back home, particularly for students. Yeah. But then, when the six of us, all being in IT, mm -hmm. we found each other, one another, somehow, mm -hmm. we did agree we would be sharing news. So, maybe Shem would call home, mm -hmm. get news, and then we started with a little circulation email list mm -hmm. for the six, which later grew to become Kenyanet, mm -hmm. later gave back to Kenya community abroad, mm -hmm. And uh, along with the six other diaspora associations from Kenya Diaspora Alliance, which I lead at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> other than that, um, of course, um, we when, when I came back from um, studies home, I realized I couldn't do any meaningful research without internet. Mm -hmm. So that's when we worked together with the support of U.S. National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. NSF, together with the U.K., um, um, ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, now DFID, mm -hmm. and British Council, were able to get internet in. Mm -hmm. But I must, I must say it wasn't a walk in the path, mm -hmm. park, because um, real-time, before we got real-time internet, mm -hmm. we had what we're calling dial-up internet. Uh -huh. So we used to, we had a server, and this time it was in one of the bedrooms, mm -hmm. which used to pull London Greennet is a service provider, I believe it's still there, mm -hmm. current banks. We used to dial every Wednesday midnight mm -hmm. to pick all mails destined for Kenya mm -hmm. and then offload those which were going out. Mm -hmm. 
So we did that for a while, and then we increased the frequency. We moved from once a week mm -hmm. to twice a week, mm -hmm. um, to once daily, to twice daily, mm -hmm. to once hourly, until we eventually got real-time internet. Mm -hmm. To get real-time internet, we needed a list line, which had a direct link to the U.S., in this case to Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, National Science Foundation had uh, uh, sent to us Randy Bush, uh, uh, an internet freak uh, fundi who assisted a lot of developing world, uh, mm -hmm. not just Africa, to get onto internet. But to get that link, uh, what was called a list line, mm -hmm. a narrow band, what 9,600 characters per second, we call it mm -hmm. 9.6 kilobits mm -hmm. per second, was costing $16,000 per month. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, now this probably three or four times that amount. Mm -hmm. That was an extremely narrow pipe. We couldn't talk of broadband. Mm -hmm. Now people get into their homes to megabits, uh, mm -hmm. which is many thousands, thousands of times faster. Yeah. So obviously, as a non-profit organization, we wouldn't have been able to afford it. Mm -hmm. But of course, with a light touch, um, when my former boss at the University of Nairobi would come and find me working late in the laboratories trying to get Kenya connected to the internet. Mm -hmm. He would sometimes come 9 p.m. and find me at the laboratory. He thought I was idle. <laughs> so he decided that, no, you need to be given more teaching classes. So I was added loads because in his opinion, if I had nothing to do at home, yeah. then uh, get him more classes that's to teach. Oh, now, okay. that's the kind of frustration I had to go through as a researcher. Uh, but. The rest is history. Okay. It was extremely important to have internet, not just for um, academic work, but uh, business was fast moving in that regard, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, civil societies. A number of the UN uh, agencies that are active in Nairobi were also utilizing the facility and uh, other regional and, uh, mult um, and um, global uh, multinational corporations too in Nairobi. But I must also give tribute. In the year 2000, when the Computer Society of Kenya uh, uh, awarded me the Father of Internet uh, decoration, I dedicated it to the three senior Kenyans uh, because I think it's them who deserve the accolades. Without them, perhaps the Internet wouldn't have happened then. Mm -hmm. I'm fully alive the fact that, um, and this happened when I was a member of parliament, the then head of state uh, uh, at a rally in one of our towns, Nakuru, did uh, pronounce that uh, we didn't need computers because they were going to take away jobs from Kenyans. At that time, being chairman of the Computer Society of Kenya, it was also incumbent upon me mm -hmm. to do the damage control and convince the nation that we needed computers to move ahead. Mm -hmm. But uh, having said that, government was also very concerned about communications. Faxes were regulated, telephone calls were monitored, uh, presumably that they would be used by the bad boys, uh, those who were considered to be in the opposition. Mm -hmm. So for how did government allow internet to happen? Because internet was a great threat mm -hmm. uh, to government then. It was the three sons, uh, the ambassador, Kenya's then ambassador, Ben Kukulei, who was an ambassador in the U.S., uh, former governor of the Central Bank. I had a lot of, and I still have a lot of respect for him, Mika Chesarem. By the way, he used to have what he was calling the governor's luncheon monthly. And I think I was one of the ten so-called eminent Kenyans Mm -hmm. who used to go to the lunch and lunch shots and but I was very young. Mm -hmm. The rest uh, were eminent Kenyans, mainly in business. Mm -hmm. um, so Mika Chesarem, and then last but not least was uh, uh, Wilson Boynet, who was then the Director General of uh, uh, today what we call the National Intelligence Service, NIS. Um, Mika Chesarem had just gone to the U.S., Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Kip Clay, Ambassador Kip Clay, did um, get him to the internet, mm -hmm. and he was able to access news from Kenya real time. He said, "Wow, this wasn't possible, tell him, tenable." Mm -hmm. So 
ambassador told him when you go back to Nairobi look for this young man called Shem. Mm-hmm. So that's how we connected and the rest again is history. You've touched on some of the difficulties that you faced mm-hmm. especially trying to you know bring internet into the country. Right. Having people who didn't really believe in the internet then. Right. Um but how did you say how did you go about trying to tackle um you know sort of like commercializing it mm-hmm. or like right. you, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, again, as I did indicate when we started KenyaNet, there were six of us. Three of the colleagues were at MIT. I wish I had uh, an enterprising uh, antenna more then, because mm-hmm. for me, first was me fulfilling a research need. There's no way we could do meaningful research without uh, internet. But I uh, little did I realize I was also sitting on a gold mine. It's a pity I didn't get any royalties from the internet. Mm-hmm. But our three colleagues from MIT, two of them in particular, Isi Makatiani mm-hmm. and uh, Gakio Karanja, mm-hmm. um, they did team up mm-hmm. uh, with other colleagues uh, mm-hmm. to start Africa Online because they saw the commercial aspect of this. I guess in our case, uh, ARCC Africa Regional Center for Computing was non-profit. So our goal was to provide service. I must mention before that, we worked together with uh, Delta College in Michigan and uh, Rift Valley Institute for Science and Technology. We had brought into Kenya more than 11,000 computers, mm-hmm. both new and refurbished, to go into rural schools as donations. Yeah. So my our goal then was more like, how do we developmental yeah. rather than commercial, commercial yeah but um yes um, it would have been good that uh, we should have thought of entrepreneurship training yes which is one thing i think our young people lack they're not given um financial literacy financial education savings culture and entrepreneurship which we need a lot more of okay. Definitely agree. I think it's interesting you bring up African on, Africa Online because mm-hmm. I think sometimes when people right. talk about internet, that's yes. what they um, that's where they think it came from, but right. not knowing the story behind it right. fully. That's right. Yeah, actually, that's a misnomer that needs to be corrected. Yeah. In the year um, was it? I think two thousand and five, Africa Online, which was one of uh, the earlier pioneer internet service providers mm-hmm. but it came after Africa Regional ARCC okay. so i do know in some history books is recorded that they were the first no they were the first commercial commercial provider but not the first uh, ISP the first ISP we banged on that date 24th October 1995 was the Africa Regional mm-hmm. Center for Computing Okay, very interesting you say that because there's actually a question that asked about um Amolo Bueno oh, right, and the yes. role she played. But right. I did some research and discovered she was sort of at Africa Online. Yes, she was part she was one of the co directors, co founders of Africa Online. Yeah. There were three of them. There was no. Akio, there was Aisi and there was uh, Amolo Bueno. Yeah. Um, and it's good that um she was one of the few women at the time, I both in business as well as um, in science and technology but yes it would be important that um uh, the misnomer is corrected mm-hmm. that um there's also what we call those in communications call it the creation story yeah. it depends on who tells the, the story. story but yes the pioneer internet service provider was Africa Regional Center for Computing but uh, again we work together a lot with some of the founders particularly the the other to Gakio and uh uh IEC before uh, uh Amolo did join to assist even get institutions either modems because to join the internet initially when it was dial up mm-hmm. a- apart from having the phone they needed to have modems which were the go betweens like uh, so We did help uh, Dr. Matunda Machinya and Chama and the other early members of Kenyanet. Mm-hmm. Before Kenyanet, we had uh, what was called CACT, mm-hmm. uh, Kenya Association for the Advancement of Computer Technology, of which I was founding chair. And uh, engineer Peter Mwaniki in the US uh, was vice chair. Mm-hmm. We did work 
together a lot to try and assist as many of educational institutions, government institutions, as well as research institutions and NGOs mm -hmm. in Kenya to get onto the internet. But even as we're doing that, wearing the heart of the Kenya Computer Computer Society of Kenya, which previously was called KCI, mm -hmm. Kenya Computer Institute, with my predecessor, uh, um, George Okado, one of the older IT gurus, mm -hmm. uh, I think of whom the three of us since have uh, been invited into the IT Hall of Fame, that uh, Dr. Crotha Pepel, a little older generation ahead of us, together with George Okado and myself. So we, George Crother, Crother used to run uh, um, a, a monthly magazine on IT, mm -hmm. um, which helped a lot in terms of educating people, creating awareness about computers. Mm -hmm. Lastly, let me just mention, I remember at one point, I think it was around 96, having a workshop for members of parliament. Mm -hmm. And this is probably where I got the passion, started thinking of going to politics. Mm -hmm. We ended up with 31 members of parliament, which was a record, a workshop on computers. I think many were just curious to get to know a bit about computers and so on. Mm -hmm. And I remember the late Dr. Honorable Kio Mbaka, an eminent lawyer, who rose to become a chair or co-chair of Constitutional Change Task Committee, mm -hmm. told me, Shem, what you're telling us sounds so good, but it doesn't make sense to us. Maybe you need to be one of us. Mm -hmm. uh, that way we could listen to you more. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, they thought uh, that computers were of input, but perhaps they needed to be on the decision-making table. Mm -hmm. And that really was my desire and passion to get to politics, to contribute to the technology revolution that was taking place then. And I'm glad it was not in vain because there were achievements that came with it when I successfully joined parliament in the year, the 8th parliament in the year 1997. The laptop programming oh, in Rwanda. Right. Oh, yeah. Maybe you can tell us just a bit about it.